you won't find us any the lamer. It's Justin, Blair, Kiki, and Kyance. Tune in your computing appliance. We've got lots to discuss. Log on in, chat with us. Coming up, it's This Week in Science! And we have no theme music. Yay! Yay! <laughs> theme music so will be... Yeah, we pretend with the dancing. This is where we normally dance, everyone. Um, <laughs> so hopefully this broadcast is going out. Uh, this is the first time trying the Google Plus Hangouts for uh, This Week in Science's broadcast. So happy Thursday, Blair. Good science to you, Kirsten. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you here. Justin is out tonight, unfortunately, but we are here, never fear, with more science for your ears. And lots of rhymes, apparently. Yeah. Apparently I felt we'll... inspired earlier. I went with it. Yeah, you, you did. That was good. That was really good. <laughs> so anyway, we have lots of science lined up in the show today. I brought stories about where water might have come from. Do we really ask those questions? Yes, we do. Where did water come from? Additionally, I have a lot of little tidbitty notes that we'll get to at some point. Uh, some stories about predicting molecular bonds in intense environments, how to spy in the shower, and iron at sea. What did you bring, Blair? Well, naturally, I brought some information about invertebrate sex. Wouldn't of course, be it wouldn't be a show without, without it. Invertebrate sex. Uh, I also brought a story about animal brain size in relation to species survival. It was all over the internet this week. I brought a little bit of world robot domination and some recent developments in the human brain. That sounds awesome. So let's get to it. Hopefully I will be adept at all of this switching and missing and all this kind of stuff. And Blair, while you're talking, if you ever feel, or if you're listening to me talk and you find something online, if you ever feel the need to screen share, there's a little button at the top, you can hit screen share Ooh. and um, it will replace your image with uh, whatever, you're, whatever you want to share. So, Oh, um, that's cool. Yeah, so uh, we can both do this back and forth and add to the add to the enjoyment of this video program while we're doing it live. Um, nice. Not necessarily the audio aspects, but the video. <laughs> Great. Exactly. So let's get this show on the road. Oh, my audio is a little fuzzy. We will. I'll fix that in a minute. Thanks for the heads up. So let's talk a little bit about iron in the ocean. This is a story that we have followed for uh, a while, actually. Um, we've talked about geoengineering on this show many, many times. Um, turn down a little bit of the gain there and see if that fixes the audio a little bit. But we... Uh, We've talked about engineering, geoengineering on the show quite a bit. And the idea of geoengineering is that you use engineering techniques, things that we know from physics, chemistry, uh, and apply them to the biology, the ecology of our planet, or any planet for that matter. And geo geoengineering ideas have uh, become... I guess more popular topics of conversation in recent years because of climate change. And so people are worried about the oceans rising, about uh, the climate getting warmer, all of the changes that are going to occur over the next 100 or so years mm. will be pretty, pretty dramatic. So are there dramatic things that we can do? Like can we put giant reflectors in space to block sun and keep it right. from getting to the surface of the planet? And one of the ideas that was thrown about or has been thrown about is uh, for carbon sequestration. So uh, to be able to get carbon out of the atmosphere and actually bury it, bury it in the earth. And so um, what researchers have been talking about doing is putting iron, just elemental iron, as a nutrient into the oceans where there are little tiny organisms called phytoplankton. Phytoplankton um, are at the base of our food chain and they are absolutely necessary for all sorts of life 
to be here. Uh, they're, they're absolutely necessary in the ecological processes. However, the great thing about them is uh, they like iron. And so if there's iron available, it will allow their numbers to bloom. They mm -hmm. will bloom and blossom and reproduce, and there will be a lot more of them. If there are a lot more of them, they will be uh, taking in more carbon dioxide. They will be photos. Uh, they will be uh, using the light that comes to comes to the surface of the plant. They will be taking in carbon dioxide. And then they die, and when they die, they sink to the bottom of the ocean. They're these little plants in the water. They take in carbon dioxide, let out oxygen, and then they they combine that carbon dioxide with their own molecules, and then they die. And they either get eaten by animals or other fish, things in the ocean that eat them, or they just sink to the bottom to become part of the detritus at the bottom of the ocean where they can get buried in the sediments and in that sense sequester carbon. So some researchers actually did a trial of this. Long story short is uh, we, we talked about this ages ago going, gosh, I can't believe they actually decided to do this. But they they threw a bunch of iron into an eddy, an ocean eddy current, so that they knew that it would be pretty self-contained. Within an eddy current, a lot of the water just stays there. It doesn't end up getting uh, moved outward. And so um, they put seven tons of iron sulfate into the ocean in, this, in an eddy current near Antarctica, and the iron levels there are pretty low, so the added iron caused a bloom of phytoplankton, and the phytoplankton began to die after about three week, weeks, and the scientists have been uh, monitoring the area and have said that most of the diatoms, the phytoplankton, sank to the bottom, probably 3,800 meters below the surface of the ocean. And so it's kind of a proof of concept that this could could work. Uh, there's, there have been a number of articles that are pretty interesting. Um, the One of them, uh, one article out of uh, The Guardian is uh, dumping iron at a sea can bury carbon for centuries, talks about the study, and uh, it was written by Damian Carrington. Really, really great, uh, great article, and they have a wonderful infographic where they show step one, oceans naturally absorb carbon dioxide, you mm -hmm. add sulfate to the ocean, step two, step three, the availability of that iron prompts the phytoplankton to bloom, bloom mm -hmm. and grow forever. Mm -hmm. Phytoplankton, right? If I didn't have a code in the nose, this would sound a little better. But um, anyway, step four: phytoplankton die and fall to the ocean floor, where the carbon dioxide is held for centuries. Great, end of story. That's pretty awesome. Yep. Yeah. So, I don't know. What do you think, Blair? What do you What do you think about this idea of tossing iron into the oceans and seeing what happens? Well, of all of the ideas, <laughs> at least it's based on natural processes, right? So it's not like we're adding a bunch of synthetic stuff and expecting it to fix things and not knowing what the long-term effects are. This is something that happens naturally, right? So yeah. of all of the things that we could try to interfere with, at least it's a natural process. But it's hard for me to believe that it wouldn't be an issue down the line in some way. That the iron, if we increase the amount of iron in the ocean, there's going to be some sort of other effect that we weren't expecting or something. Yeah, I've, uh, I, I've, I think that's one of the main concerns about anything like this. For their study, it was a very small area. Uh, seven tons of iron in the scheme of the ocean and our planet. It's a drop in the bucket so to speak, but uh, it did significantly increase the amount of iron in that area. Um, but is this the kind of thing that we could do consistently? I mean, what would, it, what would be required for us to uh, put massive amounts of iron, seed massive amounts of iron throughout the oceans of the world uh, in order to increase phytoplankton? And then if we increased it enough, right. I mean, would we end up with uh, more anoxic regions? Would we end up with... Uh, you know, where the phytoplankton or, or 
outcompete other species or where algae grow or I don't yeah the ecological ramifications I don't know that they've been completely uh, sussed out one of the things that the uh, uh, that people have talked about is uh, that and there's a really interesting let's see if I can oh, that's not what I want to do let's see if I can get the uh, the right window open um, there's a, a great compilation of the articles that are out there on the Knight Science Journalism Tracker, and they um, they have said that it's um, that the carbon sequestration is probably at this point not something that would be uh, would really have a massive effect that this would be that to do a large scale operation that they still don't know if it would actually have a major impact on atmospheric carbon dioxide. Hmm. Anyway. Wow. Well, I mean I suppose it's time for us to do something. <laughs> <laughs> something it's drastic. gotten to that point like you know how they talk about the classic analogy of climate change being like the ship that's heading towards a shore and you have to start turning it way before it gets to shore for it to yeah. actually effectively steer out of the way and how we're kind of at that threshold or we may have just passed that threshold where we can no longer steer hard enough to get completely out of the way before there's catastrophic events which we're obviously seeing happening anyway so I don't know, maybe it is time to kind of take extreme measures and try to just throw a bunch of stuff into the ocean and see if we can fix it. <laughs> yeah, who cares? The corals are dying. The, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The At ocean. what point do you just go, well, you know, pro-con list, well, let's just put it in there. <laughs> the planet's already a trash heap. I don't yeah. know. This is uh, extreme times ex call for extreme, extreme measures. measures. Right. Yeah. Extreme measures for the clean up the neighborhood campaign, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get it working. But anyway, I think that's uh, one of the most interesting stories from this week just because it's something that's been so just ongoing and we've, mm -hmm. we've talked about it before and so it's just really neat to actually see something that we've talked about and, and kind of said, hey, they're going to do this, wonder what's going to happen and now we actually have results. It worked. So That's there you go. awesome. Yeah. What did you bring? What do you want to well, talk about? Well, I thought it would be appropriate to open on some invertebrate sex. <laughs> very now, apropos, right? Yes. So, very first, I want to talk about one of my favorite invertebrates. Uh, I, I personally love cephalopods, and squids are quite interesting in the cephalopod family. So I learned something very interesting about cephalopod copulation, that uh, there's this one kind of squid called the dumpling squid. <laughs> they're only about seven centimeters long. They're very tiny squid. But a little bit they, of they expend quite a bit of energy in sex. And it turns out that these guys, the males actually physically restrain the females um, which was kind of surprising to me to begin with because I know that a lot of cephalopod species spend a lot of time, especially with their, um, their color changes and their chromatophores, trying to convince a female to copulate with them. So it seems like even when she's assented, then he physically has to hold her in place and she spends the entire act struggling to get away, which first <laughs> of all does not sound fun. No, right. <laughs> but you would think that this would tire out the male pretty effectively. Turns out it tires out the male and the female, and it makes their ability to swim almost null for up to 30 minutes. Wow. So they can't swim. They can't, you know, evade predators. They can't, they can't eat. They can't hunt food. And I found that really interesting because that was something they had no idea about. And suddenly that totally changes a lot of the sexual dynamic with, within these squid is, first of all, before you're even ready to mate, you probably want to pick a place to mate where there's a very close hiding space because that's the other thing they found out is a lot of the squid will hide and camouflage themselves and just chill out until they're ready to go again. So that's a whole other idea is you're 
your location has to be good for uh, hiding afterwards, and then also you have to feed really well before the act because you're not going to be able to directly afterwards. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It adds a whole other level of dimension to it that is pretty interesting to me. <laughs> well, it's not. It's it. You have to kind of. I just wonder if they if they plan at all or you know. Okay, is it good? We got we ha we have the rest of the afternoon clear. <laughs> Our schedule's clear. We can. <laughs> we're not going to be bothered here. We can just we can copulate, relax for thirty minutes, get our strength back, and then and then see you later. Well, I would say for most animals, probably not. Right. But I do know that cephalopods they they learn very quickly from experience, very very quickly. And so it would, that would be what I would be interested to see, is to study these guys in the wild and see if they follow a specific, specific um, pattern uh, mm -hmm. related to their mating, since it is so cost effective. Um, so it's, it's interesting because they only did it, in, they only really looked in the lab, pretty much. So they, they didn't observe it in the wild directly yet. Right. They, what they did is they, they watched the um, the copulation and then they turn the waves on in their tank to make them try to swim. They kind of just hunker down to the side. I can't handle this right now. <laughs> so the next thing, I mean, for cephalopods, I mean, the great thing, like you mentioned, they do have the ability to camouflage themselves. So they, mm. they hide pretty well among the rocks and they probably yep. don't just choose a spot that's like way out in the open. Right. For this act. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, being in the lab, it's not the natural environment, and so you always try and make something as close to an ethological uh, so study as possible, so as close to natural as you possibly can get. But, I mean, still, like you said, aside from being a researcher, there's no other, like, predator, there's no other environmental stimulus that would really bother them. And cephalopods supposedly are pretty smart animals. Yeah, super smart. That's why I find them so interesting. Um, and then real quick, my other invertebrate sex story was about orb web spiders. More spiders! We, we've talked about them before, the orb weavers. And we yeah. spent a long, long time talking about um, the genital mutilation aspect of their sex in that if the if the male is not cannibalized which happens quite often the female will actually castrate the male and what they found was that orb web spiders who have been castrated are better fighters and more agile that's weird well it is weird at first until you look at the fact that the genitals of an orb spider is 9% of their mass. Aha, so 9%, so, it's close, round up, that's close to 10%. Yeah. So you're, you're really dealing with um, a, a significant portion of their body mass. Right. And you get right. rid of it, and suddenly I feel much lighter, much springier. There's a spring in my step. Yeah, so of course in the article they had to relate it to something that we could understand. Fathom. And so right. they said that... For a reference, an, a 185-pound human male, if he had 9% mass in his genitals, his genitals would weigh 17 pounds. 17 so you can pounds. imagine how easily <laughs> lost 17 pounds. That is definitely going to speed you up. And they found that, <laughs> that sometimes they become what they call full eunuchs, where they're completely castrated. Wow. Other times the females will end up only um, taking half off, and they'll call them half eunuchs because they have two uh, palps. So what they found was an 80% increase in physical endur endurance in full eunuchs from before and after, uh, and a 32% increase in half eunuchs. And the sad part is in this uh, experiment, they didn't actually get to become eunuchs the natural way, which is at least there's a trade-off. They actually went in with magnifying glasses and razor blades oh. to do the experiment to figure this out. And it's then spider is, genital mutilation. This is, this is the hilarious part, though. They, quote-unquote, 
irritated the spiders with small paint brushes until they were exhausted. Wow. So they're they're chasing them around their their little enclosure with the with a paintbrush and to see how much endurance they had, which seems kind of mean, but and science, a stopwatch, yeah. of course. Okay, you, go. Yeah. You have to run find spider. out a way. Run spider, to run. Exhaust a spider, and I guess that's going to be with a paintbrush. <laughs> well, you're not going to put a spider on a treadmill, so. No, that's true. Although I would pay to see that. <laughs> I would too. <laughs> Oh my goodness, everyone, if you uh, just tuned in, you are watching This Week in Science Twists. I'm Dr. Kiki, and I am joined by the wonderful Blair Bestarch, and uh, unfortunately, we are not joined by Justin Jackson this evening. He is on a little reprieve from twist duty for the... Uh, I don't know, next couple of weeks maybe? I'm not sure. But we still have the science news, so uh, let's see. Let's move it on up. Um, what was I going to talk about next? What brought us water? You want to know where water came from? I would love to know where water came from. This is another story, uh, the basis of which we've talked about previously on the show. Uh, where on our planet has water come from? So, uh, where, uh, where, oh, where did we get all of our oceans, our, our icebergs, our ice caps, all the water that we find here on this pale blue dot that we call home? Previous studies have suggested that the water comes from comets, that it came from comets during the late bombardment period of our uh, solar system's evolutionary history. A lot of evidence has pointed in that direction. Well, a brand new study that is out in science this last week doesn't agree. It, it thinks that, no, not comets, but meteors, meteorites. That, okay. um, and it's a really interesting, interesting method of study that they have used. So, the meteorites have gotten the, the finger from this this group, Conal Alexander and colleagues, because they've looked at a, co at a, uh, a, a molecule uh, known as deuterium. So uh, deuterium, well, an atom, deuterium, replacing hydrogen. Deuterium is heavy hydrogen mm -hmm. um, in water. And so a small amount of all the water on our planet has deuterium in it. Um, already and there are lots of great applications for possible applications for deuterium like in nuclear fission and um, that's possibly going to be happening in the next 10 or 15 or so years so we're excited about that energy from a cup of water right that'd be great it's all from deuterium so deuterium can be observed in all sorts of things uh, and so these researchers examined 86 chondrite meteorite samples compared them to comets uh, objects from Saturn's moon, Enceladus. Uh, they compared it to other objects in the, in the solar system. And what they found is that there's a clear division between the uh, what are called carbonaceous chondrites and, these, uh, and comets. And so these carbonaceous chondrites are are the meteorites that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the technical term. The carbonaceous or carbon-containing uh, chondrites, these rocky meteorites, um, some of them, a one class is called CI chondrites for carbonaceous evuna for a region in Africa where they were discovered. And uh, chondrite is the internal structure. And so the carbonaceous chondrites are probably from asteroids in the asteroid belt region, according to this article from Ars Technica. And so there's this division between the comets. The comets really high in deuterium, and the chondrites were really low in deuterium. And the it, in, one an interesting point that they that they found out is that uh, Enceladus, the moon of of uh, Saturn, was relatively comic comet-like, so high in deuterium, and Jupiter family comets, what they uh, called JFCs, resembled 
our planet in the abundance of deuterium or how much of it was found. And so uh, looking at the deuterium con content, distance from the sun, um, uh, the eight, and also the age of things, knowing how far things would have traveled, how long it would have taken to get here, um, at what point in time they would have gotten here and bombarded our planet. The CI chondrites that were originally found in Africa have the most obvious deuterium correspondence to the system at the early days of our solar system when we would have possibly been, um, when, when it would have been possible for water to form on our planet. Mm. Yeah, and so um, according to this article, there are two consequences that come out of it. Comets are unlikely to be the source of the water that we find here, and um, secondarily that Earth's water probably came from the asteroid belt. So instead of coming in from far outside and traveling um, you know, from far distances to the, at the outer reaches of our solar system to the inner solar system where we are, uh, much, much closer, actually. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So it's all from looking at seawater. That's find amazing. That. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's, it's not the end of the story. There right. is a lot of evidence that does suggest that comets are the source, but this right. is another piece of evidence in the puzzle. And so uh, people are, are chemists, geochemists, are going to put all of these pieces together, and eventually, at some point, we will have a much better picture of exactly uh, where water came from mm -hmm. uh, on, our, in, on our planet, you know, the formation of our solar system, the formation of our planet, its whole history, etc. You got some... Uh, Animal news? Yes, I have an Animal Corner story today. It's a bit vague. Blair's <laughs> Animal Corner with Blair Likes Hippos. Yes. <laughs> so uh, today I have a story about animals kind of in general and about how there's been a lot of extensive studies lately that have come to light relating to brain to body size ratios, which... Mm -hmm does not, right off, let me just explain, it does not mean the bigger the brain, the better. It's the bigger the brain in relation to the body size. And what they found was that mostly, this is for the smaller scale of mammals, they have found that the big-brained, smaller mammals were more likely to survive the possibility of extinction in the past. They looked um, from mam at mammalian species from paleo to modern, and they looked at 229 species for over 40 million years, and half of the species they looked at were already extinct. And they kind of plotted these guys on the, the curve. There's a, there's a pretty reliable curve already of brain size to body size, where most animals fit. There's just a little bit of outliers on the outside of those lines. And you'll find that the more large an animal gets, the more their brain size kind of tapers and won't get any larger, even if the animal gets larger, which we can talk about later. It makes sense to me. But what they found was that the outliers that had larger brains generally survive the large extinction events as opposed to the ones who had smaller brains, which huh. also makes perfect sense to me because if you're a small animal, you can't get by on brute force. You have to get by with wit in how to adapt in situations where, and this is the, the meaning of the word adapt not related to evolution, but in your activity and your actions that you can kind of use strategy and use that big brain to your advantage when your surrounding environment is changing. And then yeah. another recent study about brain size said that when you took an animal and you put them into an unfamiliar environment or a new habitat, if they had a bigger brain and they were a smaller animal, they were more likely to succeed in that environment. Right. So the... The bigger the brain, just generally, the the more able they are. 
Right. I would say to get, to get by. Maybe yeah. resilient would be resilient. a good word, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, of course, they related this to climate change because mm-hmm. you can you can probably predict which species are going to be able to make the change and which are not. And so the big question at the end of this article was, does that mean we invest in the big-brained animals because they're the most likely to respond to our help? Or does that mean we invest in the small-brained animals because they need our help the most? Yeah, the thing that, the point that uh, just kind of bugs me here, though, is, is we know that brain size and body size are linked. And so there is a large portion of your brain that is just devoted to maintaining your body, to Mm -hmm. moving your body, to just being in charge of this corporeal form. And so I, I just wonder, I mean, we know, I know there are a lot of small animals who are incredibly intelligent for their size. And right. so it's a, a big question to me as to, okay, the bigger brained animals did better, they survived, but right. is it because they were smarter or more right. able, you know, more able, or is it because they were a little bit bigger, maybe they had a little more mass that enabled them to deal with climate right. change, maybe mm-hmm. they uh, were a little faster or you know, something that gave them an advantage physically, but right. not necessarily intelligence-wise. Well, and it all comes down to how you measure intelligence. Yeah. Because there's, you know, the classic idea of a bird brain. They have very small... So untrue. Brain, it's so untrue. So many birds are so <laughs> smart. So yeah. smart. They have language skills. They have social skills. But then there are other animals that I guess might be better at resiliency at at building new uh, shelters for themselves when they're broken over and over or finding a new place to live. You know, there's so many different ways of measuring intelligence. So I would take this and we, uh, what I would do with extant mammals is I would look at brain function and see if there was a specific area of the brain that's that's more developed or is used more with these big brained animals and see if there's something going on there. Yeah. It, it just, it, that was my issue with it too, was that how do you say, we, you know, bigger is not better, and a mm-hmm. big brain does not necessarily mean you're smarter. Yep. Uh, a, a person with a bigger head size does not have a higher IQ. That doesn't always happen. So it, that's, that is the part that's very odd to me. Um, what I was going to say about the bigger animals is that, you know, if you're a little marmoset, you might need more brain power to be able to survive through tough times, but if you're a rhinoceros, the brain might not be the part that you need. <laughs> so it does make sense to me that, that the intelligence factor would, would mean more in a smaller animal because they can't rely on brute strength to get themselves along, and that's not their main um, strength, really, is, is their physical strength. Their main strength is is maybe their social structure or their yeah. their intelligence. So it's 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 the tip of the iceberg, just like we were talking about before, with so many of these stories. It's it's the very first finding in what hopefully will lead to a whole new area of research. Yeah, and I think that, you know, it's important and I'm sure the researchers have already thought of this, but it's very important not to equate brain brain size with intelligence right. or cognitive right. function. Um, and that's an error that a lot of researchers have have made in the past. And specifically, yeah. uh, from my experience looking uh, at the bird research, bird literature, it's it, it's happened a lot in 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 that area. Um, you know, don't don't repeat past mistakes, people. Right. Exactly. And I think that's why the article was very careful to never. I don't think they ever said the word intelligence in there, or yeah, if they did, sure they didn't, didn't really say it specifically. They were just, they were, they just basically said survivorship. They and survived. Yeah. yeah, they survived. They had bigger brains. They survived. That was basically what they kept like. So it's it's that's, strictly that's correlative right now. That's all yeah. they have. Yeah. But now the question is why? Why? <laughs> that's why? the question. Always the question. Why? Why is there this <laughs> correlation? Yes. All right. Well, I think that we've made it to the end of the first half of the show. Yes. 
Yay! Yeah, I, think, I think we've done pretty well. Yay! <laughs> so, once again, we have no music because... Can I play music on Google Plus and share it? I don't know how that would happen. I'd have you to could try. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to figure out new ways to do this. Okay. I will. I will figure out new ways to do this. I just don't know what they are right now. So, stay tuned. We'll be back after these messages with more This Week in Science. And here are the messages. Twist would like to thank Audible.com for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Science. With over 100,000 audiobooks in their library, Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks online. And you can get a free audiobook download today. That's right. If you sign up right now at audiblepodcast.com slash twist, audiblepodcast.com slash twist, T-W-I-S, you'll get a free audiobook download of your choice. And we have found all sorts of downloads over the years, science-related mostly, but there are all sorts of other things that you can find and fancy there um, in their library. So I'll leave it up to you to find something great, but I will have to say that my, my recent favorite is uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, and I hope you enjoy that as well. Audiblepodcast.com slash twist. Additionally, Twist also has merchandise that you might enjoy, so you can head on over to our wonderful website, which is twist.org, T-W-I-S dot O-R-G, to uh, get one of our wonderful CDs that are available. We have uh, CDs available for sale, the 2010 Science Music Compilation is currently available. That's right, 2010, I, I did say it, and I also did say CD, so head on over there and get yourself a 2010 science music compilation or a World Robot Domination t-shirt. They are available, and if you order them, we'll send them to you, and you support Twist in the process. Additionally, if you head to any of the most recent episodes, head on over Scroll down through the show notes, maybe listen to the most recent episode, make a comment in the comment section. You'll also notice that there are some pink donation buttons down at the bottom of every show page. And these donations, if you make them, they really do help us make this show possible. So without your support, we really could not do this. Your support allows us to pay for contractors that we need to hire, hosting bandwidth, all sorts of fun things that we try to do occasionally. And we do appreciate any amount that you are able to give $2 to $2 million if you've even gotten that. And um, we accept the donations through PayPal. It is a PayPal donation, and the process is really easy. You just click on one of those buttons, twist.org. Make a donation. We thank you for support, for your support. We really couldn't do it without you. And now back to the show. Welcome back, Yay. Claire. Welcome, Welcome back, back to you. <laughs> <laughs> we are back. This is I'm this happy to science. be back. That's right. You went so far away. So far away from us. That's right. Science in the house. We have many more stories to get through in the hour. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I have a story that is kind of fun about how to spy in the shower. Well, maybe. Mm. I mean, you could possibly interpret it this way. I mean, the paper authors brought up this possibility, actually. So I'm not even reaching really far here. It's the, it's the authors themselves who have, who have brought up the idea of being able to see through a shower curtain um, <laughs> with this technology. So interesting technology that's been developed by a group of researchers, Ori Katz, Aaron Small, and Yaron Silberberg. They have uh, developed a, uh, a, an interesting technology uh, that they've published in Nature Photonics. And they use what is called a spatial light modulator, or an SLM, to change uh, light wave fronts that go through. So the, the waves of light that are coming away from a light source and that go through a scattering medium, like a shower curtain, or through a piece of paper, uh, for instance. 
and um, this SLM, spatial light modulator, and then a, a simple bandpass filter uh, and a digital camera are able to cohere instead of decohere to um, constructively take the waveforms in order to see things that are printed on um, on objects. So, for example, if I had a piece of paper with like the letter A written on it mm -hmm. here, which I don't right now, but you if you shine a light from the wall in an incandescent bulb, mm -hmm. the light reflects off of the piece of paper. And then if you were to try and pick up that reflected light somewhere, you would just get the reflected light, right? You wouldn't necessarily, right. like I'm bouncing light off the wall right now to be able to have this wonderful glow. But um, you c can't actually see what's written on the calendar, on the wall, on the other o over here that uh, the light is bouncing off of. But with this technology, with the spatial light modulator, the way that it, uh, instead of destructively uh, affecting the light, light waves, it constructively affects them so that uh, patterns can be reconstructed and that mm. stuff that's written on a wall can be read, so you could potentially see around a corner with this technology. Um, you could see something very clearly through a shower curtain. Um, the it, it's kind of an it, it's got sneaky applications, you know, like spy connotations applications. Mm -hmm. But in reality, what uh, the exciting app applications of this technology will be are actually being able to um, scan and see into soft tissue. So being able to see mm -hmm. into uh, muscle or, um, you know, right now we have x-rays so that we can see bone, but it's really hard to be able to get an image of your organs or what's happening, um, you know, what ha what's happening internally in an object. So soft tissue is really hard to image and this kind of wavefront construction or reconstruction could actually go a long way towards advancing that area to allowing surgeons to be able to see stuff in real time. And, and that's another advancement of this technology is that it's not, it doesn't have to go through a bunch of, uh, of computer modulation that takes a long time, not a lot of processing to actually allow it to happen. It's real time, you get the result and, mm -hmm. uh, and you're seeing around a corner or through wow. a shower curtain or into your gut. <laughs> wow, that's some trippy stuff. <sighs> it's there's definitely going to be some really good um, applications of that, but you just you immediately have to realize, you know, if this hits the market in some way, someone was saying in the chat room, X-ray specs that actually could happen. Right. It's, yeah, e exactly. It would be. It's the kind of thing that uh, you know, if light were if the light patterns are the right way and it's the right material, you could potentially see through things that normally you can't see through. Right. That's so crazy. Right? <laughs> Talk about falling into the wrong hands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Peeping Toms. Don't, oh, I, we don't no. want you to know about this technology, so uh, stop watching our show. Wait, no, it's too late. <laughs> How many the time I machine? Have is if they made x-ray specs, they would have to look ridiculously different from any other pair of glasses, so you could immediately know that <laughs> someone was wearing them. It would have to be the next, tr the next thing that's added to the Google goggles. So right. it's like the funny-looking shades that are the Google goggles that allow you to see, see everything. I mean, you're peering into the information domain anyway, so why not just go one more layer? Google goggle oh x-ray specs. Foof, 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 foof. That's crazy. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, Blair, what do you have left well, to share? Well, I'm going to let you pick. <laughs> I All have right. some world robot domination. It's always good. Mm -hmm. I have a story about women and that they might actually be smarter than men. <laughs> and a story about Lifting weights helping your brain. What would you like? Oh, 
I don't know. Are you going to get to one of these stories later? As, well, I would just... love to if we have time. Okay. All right. So people in the chat room, women <laughs> versus men, weightlifting and brains, or world robot. robot domination. Nobody has any, uh, nobody in the chat room. Women. Brain okay, weight. done. All right, good. Women versus men. It's the, it's the winner. Okay. <laughs> All right. A noted authority on intelligence testing. He is considered one of the most, the foremost experts on intelligence testing in the world. His name is James Flynn, uh, and he lives in New Zealand. <clears throat> Has been doing standardized IQ test research for a very long time, and mm -hmm. he has decided that now, this year, finally, women's IQs have surpassed men's. <laughs> Yay, we did it! Woohoo! We're smarter! Now, we before, <laughs> before all the men freak less, out... But... <laughs> yes, yeah, we get paid less, but we're smarter. Well, before everybody freaks out, let me explain. He looked specifically at 500 males and 500 females in this test in all of the quote-unquote advanced countries, uh, basically industrialized countries, and he found that women scored on average a half to a whole point higher on the IT, IQ test they were given. And the one exception was in Israel where men still scored about two points higher than women until I show up over there later. We'll see. Anyway, <laughs> but um, um, and in previous years, ever since they've been doing IQ testing, women started out five points lower than men. And mm. women have been getting s slowly smarter and smarter. Men have also been getting smarter and smarter, according to the IQ test, but the women have finally surpassed the men. And the interesting part about that is that this guy, James Flynn, he points to certain things that we can discuss, but he said that he thinks, his current theory is that the reason women have finally surpassed men in IQs is that their roles in society have changed, which in some ways I agree with. But he says that now women have to multitask. They have to work and they have to take care of children. Men are pretty much doing the same thing they always have been doing to a certain extent, with some exceptions, obviously. And so it's caused our brains to adjust and made them more adaptable and smarter. And what I would say is that, <laughs> yes, our roles have changed. And I would say, actually, what's happened is when they started doing IQ tests, women's schooling wasn't the same. And I know that yeah. IQ tests aren't really supposed to take education into effect. They're supposed to be unbiased in that. But if you're in sewing class while the boys are in math and science from sixth grade, that has to affect your brain development. Yep, I would agree with that. And that if you're getting more and more science education and math education, then that's that's going to have an effect, especially if you start it at a younger and younger age. And there's been a huge push over the last couple of decades to increase the prevalence of women going into STEM uh, STEM fields. So that's right. educationally, that's huge. Um, and we're yeah, also seeing look at, like the number of women in colleges versus before. It's just intelligence and academia in women in general, I think, is stressed so much more than it ever was. Yeah. I do wonder, though, about the, the difference in the uh, IQ points. I mean, we're talking about five points mm -hmm. to now we're two points over. Mm -hmm. Is it, I mean, how significant is that when we're talking, when we're looking at this, the IQ spread, we're talking about a, a, a hundred or on average, or, you know, we're right. talking about yeah. a pretty large number that when you're talking about one or two points, the margin of error is probably about that big. So I just wonder, yeah. you know, how accurate this report really is. Like, really, it's probably to the point of, okay, we're, we're about the same. Right. Yeah, I, w I would say you're probably right about that. Um, 
Although I would think that maybe over the years of them giving IQ tests and the, the fact that the IQ scoring is based on averages and how it's a bell curve and the exact middle is a 100, that it would seem like over the years it would, it would make it more accurate. I don't know if I'm being silly about that, but it, it seems like the more you test people on it, if you're accumulating data, it has to get the average has to get more and more narrow. Yeah. Wouldn't you think? Yeah. Yeah, you have more and more data points. Yeah. Right. And I'm not yeah. saying this is definitely true, but it, it was comforting to me that it was one of the foremost <laughs> scientists, quote unquote, on intelligence testing, which that being said, IQ tests, what does it really test? We don't really know how accurate it is based on how yeah. smart you are. There have been really smart people that have done really bad in IQ tests. They even yeah. mentioned in the article that people before have improved their scores on IQ tests, which in With theory training, you're not right? supposed to. With in, training yeah. and even in other cases, they told you, okay, we'll give you $50 if you improve your score. So there's motivation involved yeah. as well. If there's, there's a reward, oh, maybe I'll try a little harder. Maybe I'll, exactly. maybe I'll do a little and better. It, it's, you're not yeah. supposed to be able to study for an IQ test. It's supposed to be a, like an innate measurement that once you hit, in theory, around 18 years old, it shouldn't change. But That's what they think, but the, way that they, but the way that they set up the questions and every, mm -hmm. the way that everything is framed, it's mm -hmm. framed for somebody who has been through higher level math classes, who's been right. through um, higher level uh, in English and reading comprehension courses. I mean, all of the questions, it, if you give the, take two people from different uh, economic areas, different, uh, you know, you're going to have two different scores that are reflected by, you know, what, what, you know, what they've been able to learn in their area. I mean, the area that with, that's got more hardship is going to probably have generally lower scores. Right. Yeah. Have you, have you ever taken an IQ test? I tend to try to avoid them. Yeah. I have taken a couple, but I, at this point in my, I just avoid them. I think it's really my fear of failure. I, see, I've never even been offered one. I, I thought everyone took them in high school probably 30, 40 years ago, but I, yeah, I, I'd never even come across one. Yeah. I've, I, yeah, I, I took one a, a long time ago, like when I was in college. I haven't taken one in a really long time. It, my IQ has probably dropped over the last few years, right? <laughs> it's not supposed to. <laughs> not supposed to. <laughs> probably has. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> All right, let's get some more stories in here. Yeah. I have a story about, ooh, Bond predicting. Why did all my major stories end up coming from Ars Technica this week? I'm just seeing a trend here. Anywho, um, interesting science paper that suggests that there are uh, new chemical bonds or chem specific chemical bonds that can be created in very intense magnetic fields. Magnetic fields that are so intense that we don't even have them here on our planet. Mm. Yeah, we create magnetic bonds that are about uh, magnetic fields that are about seven Teslas in strength. Mm -hmm. Tesla is the unit of measurement for magnetic fields. And so MRI machines that we use for, uh, uh, for magnetic resonance imaging, usually brain and tissue scanning, seven or so Teslas uh, at the highest, um, maybe a little bit higher, but not much. Um, our magnetic field is 25 to 65 micro Teslas. So the Earth's magnetic field is actually very, very, very weak. And the strongest laboratory magnets can produce strength of about 40 Teslas. However, that's still not enough to actually find these new properties of elements that could mm. occur. Yeah, so um, the magnetic fields that surround uh, white dwarfs and neutron stars are in the thousands of tes Teslas, can be a Ooh. thousand Teslas multiple, uh, ex ex exponentially larger than that. So it's just more magnetic strength than you can even imagine. If you've ever had a rare earth magnet that you were playing with and it got stuck 
to the bottom of the desk at school and the janitor couldn't get it off, you know, you, you think that's a pretty strong magnet. Mm -hmm. oh, no. So much stronger. And so um, these researchers used basic principles to predict what would happen to the uh, simple elements, hydrogen and helium, in these really intense magnetic fields around uh, dwar white dwarfs and neutron stars. And what their calculations suggest is that there might be these new properties of, uh, of magnetic bonding. It's called uh, paramagnetism, where uh, the, the elements or the, the electrons normally are attracted to each other through electric, uh, electric attraction. But in this case, the electric doesn't work. It's mag magnetic fields that push things together, that line things up. And so um, when hydrogen atoms are perpendicular to the magnetic fields in these very, mm -hmm. very intense magnetic fields. Um, that's when they have stronger bonds. If they are uh, lined up in parallel, they do form a weak magnetic bond, but it's these per perpendicular bonds that can be formed that are really interesting. And so what they suggest is that this might, um, these might have unique signatures that we can look for. And so now they're suggesting that based on their calculations, there might be these really unique conformations of atoms in these intense magnetic fields around these, these giant bodies of uh, intense magnetism in, in space and that we might be able to look for them and be able to see whether or not they're really there, whether or not the calculations actually play out in the real world. Wow. A very interesting uh, phenomenon. Yeah. Whole new chapter in the chemistry book, that's for sure. Right. I know. <laughs> that, I think, is, I think that's really interesting because it's normally the stuff like hydrogen and helium is not really uh, considered in the magnetic yeah. Uh, you know, uh, the magnetic range of things. And so this paramagnetism, um, it has to be a really, a hydrogen in the presence of any of the magnet magnets that we have on Earth would not show paramagnetism. Right. But calculations suggest that, oh, yes, it would, that it would have, it would form into H2 molecules in the presence of this uh, very strong covalent bonding through these magnetic fields in these unique environments. And so, you know, I just, I love the idea that, uh, that there could be an additional spectrum of information that we should be looking for that we haven't yeah. really tuned into yet. That's amazing. Um, so you said that they'd expect to see this, you said near dwarf stars, right? Yes, white dwarfs and neutron okay. stars. Wow. Yeah. That's, I'm, I'm blown away by that. That's, <laughs> that's so neat. A whole new, wow, chemical bond. That's, that's really cool. And that, that was all just through kind of math and theorizing and extrapolating from the math. Exactly. So basic, <sighs> basic chemical principles and basic understandings of uh, magnetism and, well, let's just think about what would happen in this intense environment. We've never really thought about that before because we don't see it here. And so, yeah, just doing the math. And um, they don't make a lot of assumptions. And so normally making assumptions is what weakens any, uh, any uh -huh. predictive modeling that you do. But if you're not really making a lot of assumptions, that means you're not making a lot of logical jumps to get to right. your model. And so in that effect, in, in that way, they're really just going off of how things work. And so right. the likelihood of being able to actually see this um, around white dwarfs, neutron stars, these very magnetic places that it's a high likelihood that they're right. That's why I loved math so much when I was in school and why the those kinds of applications of logic, not the colloquial logic, but the math logic and and kind of stepwise reasoning is so amazing when you integrate it with scientific ideas 
that you can come to these huge far off ideas that we may never actually be able to figure out if it even exists. Hopefully we will, but we we know that it might because of the little bit of information that we do have. All you have to do is connect the dots. That's just that's the power of science. Science. So cool. That's right. <laughs> um, world robot domination. We can't leave the show without world robot yeah. domination. Bring me the bring me the story. I thought this was a really way, good way to tie in the past couple robot domination stories that you have had over the past couple weeks. We had the robot before, and then we had the, the expressive face. I think that was last week, right? From, what was it called, Silent Valley or something? Yeah, Maybe? Uncanny, Uncanny Valley, yes. <laughs> it just no, sounds just like a horror movie Valley. to me. No, yeah, yes. Uncanny Valley. Anywho, now <laughs> they have developed not out of China, shockingly, out of Newcastle in the UK, something they call Kissinger. I will say it again, Kissinger. Kissinger. <laughs> Can you guess what Kissinger does? Kiss? Yes. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a robot that, that, that you control um, separately. It's, you're supposed to have a receiver on either end of a messaging advice, that's why it's Kissinger, Kiss Messenger, is your, it's supposed to be an interactive item. And actually, I will maybe see if I can screen share here for a second. I was gonna, I was gonna see if I, have a, if I can find a video, but yeah. Here we go. It looks basically like an ostrich egg. Did it, did it go or no? Yes, I, I see oh, it, yeah. we see okay. it, oh, not anymore. It went away. I'm going to put it back. <laughs> <laughs> I hit too many buttons. I always do that. It it's, looks like an ostrich egg with a set of lips on it. <laughs> and uh, it does. It has pressure sensors and actuators in it. When you kiss it, They're very pouty lips. It is very pouty lips. The shape changes that you create are transmitted in real time to the other Kissinger. <laughs> and the quotes in this was my, was my absolute favorite part of the article people have found it a very positive way to improve intimacy and communications with their partners when they are apart and yeah. I'm sure everyone's brain is going to the same place right now yeah, but is it kissing your partner or kissing a facsimile of your partner's kiss. It's yes, yes, it's making out with a robot. And making out with a robot. It is strictly in the prototype phase. And strictly. They have, right. They have said clear. it will not be commercialized until, quote unquote, all the ethical and technical considerations are covered. I am not interested in sexual uses. <laughs> what? Well, if you're okay, not so interested, like, <laughs> too bad, because that's what's going to happen. I'm not interested in sexual uses, but it's a kissing robot. I mean, I... Yes. yes. Okay. I believe he means anything but lip contact when he lip says contact. sexual. I'm assuming that's what he means. But yeah. still, Sounds you like can't a politician's. put a Kissing definition. robot out there and not expect someone to do the inappropriate thing with it. Again, it's like putting the thing, the technology into the wrong hands. Yes. What do you expect? <laughs> it's, it's a good question. And then what happens when you bring Kissinger and robot together? <laughs> What happens? And so I've uh, I've actually found an interesting video here that uh, if I can share it, we'll uh, I'll see if it'll if it'll play. It, I don't know if we can oh. actually play the video through. Oh, I probably have to do the play through the YouTube window. Mhm. Mm um, probably. Can you hear it right now? Yeah, yeah. I can hear it. Okay, so there's music. Here comes the. It's like a, it looks like a little bunny, and there's a girl with very curly hair kissing her robot, and then there's a boy at the other end kissing his robot, and then oh my gosh. happy ending. They are 
kissing in real life. It's just like it. And of course, I saw this, and I immediately thought of the fact that this essentially this exact device was on a show that I'm sure a lot of people in the chat room watch called The Big Bang Theory. <laughs> they actually That's made right. this on The Big Bang Theory last season. And now I just I can't help but wonder if someone in the UK saw that and thought, oh, I can do that. Yeah, I can make that happen. It, a kissing it, robot. It seems like an odd coincidence that that just happened, and then maybe six months later this happened. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I just have to say, I I'm just fine not kissing a robot. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm yep. Just gonna put that out there. No robot kissing for me here. Oh, good gracious. But you know what? We did make it to the end of another wonderful hour of science. I have many more stories, so we can always throw some throw some other stories out at the end out, out after the uh, mm. after the out out and out. But um, on next week's show, once again, we will be live on Google Plus, and we'll be using the on air hangouts. Hopefully, the bugs that I had this week will be fixed by next week. Um, it will be broadcast live to YouTube Live, and you'll be able to find us by following all the social media accounts that we tell you about every week. Um, specifically, though, my account on Google+, Plus, Kiki Sanford, is the one that uh, you should follow. And my U YouTube account is youtube.com slash the Dr. Kiki, T-H-E-D-R-K-I-K-I. -K the mm. Dr. Kiki, because somebody else had Dr. Kiki, so I had to go with the Dr. Kiki. <gasps> no one else is Dr. Kiki. You're the Dr. Kiki. And somebody else took it, so that's, that's what we're going with. Shout-outs to everyone out there in the audience right now who followed us over here and actually were able to watch us today. I really do appreciate you making the journey with us. Next week will be a little bit smoother. I'll advertise it a little bit more widely. This week I didn't advertise it, so far and wide because I knew there would be growing pains. <laughs> Nothing happens easily, especially in my world. But anyway, Blair, you want to take us out? Yep. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. You can search for This Week in Science on iTunes, or you can look for the app Twist number four droid, Twist four droid, uh, in the Android marketplace. Uh, it's also, I said it's on iTunes. Is it an app on the iPhone now? I forget. That's right. It's okay. called Twist. You can just go to Twist Perfect. on the iPhone. And for more information on anything that you've heard here today, you can go to our website, twist.org, for show notes. Thanks to the lovely Blair, who completes those weekly. And additionally, uh, you can email us. I'm Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, or you can email Justin at thisweekinscience.com. And Blair, do you have an email in case people want to get in touch with you through email? Um, yes, I or do have you, my Google you, Plus email now. I have blairbaz at gmail.com. Okay. That. I, Blair, just have a, I just got my Google Plus, so I'm ready to go. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Um, you can also contact us on Twitter at Dr. Kiki or at Jackson Fly. You can also go to at Twist Science. That's the Twist Twitter feed that I put some of the stories on when I remember. And then mine is also at Blair's Menagerie. <laughs> or as Justin likes to say, yeah. Menagerie. <laughs> menagerie. <laughs> <laughs> If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address or suggestion for an interview, please let us know. And if you do email us, please remember to put twists in the subject line or it was likely to get spam filtered. Into oblivion. That's and right. we'll be back here. That's right, right here next week doing the show. And we do hope that you will join us once more for more great sciencey goodness. And if you've learned anything at all from the show today... Remember, it's all in your head. And geez, I wish I had closing music to share. That's the best I, I can do. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, <laughs> I am. I didn't 
I just didn't think about anything there. Good gracious. <sighs> At some point next week, I think this this happened. This happened when I switched to Twit. Actually, I was like, "Oh, the music. How are we <laughs> going to do the music? I'm not in the radio station." And then that got fixed. Mm -hmm. And now we've moved again, and once again I'm going, oh, the music. How am I going to play the music? So if ever, anyone has joined us newly out there, if there's anyone on YouTube or elsewhere who hasn't seen the show before and just chanced upon us today randomly, um, normally we have lots of fun music in our show, and uh, there's dance time. There is time when we dance. So, mm -hmm. um, anyway podcast can be downloaded from our website. I had some more fun science news that I didn't really get to. Um, so, what was it? DARPA has developed a, a machine for blowing out fires with sound waves. Using, okay. Yeah, using the action of sound waves, which the air is a fluid, and so you can use sound waves to move that fluid and to uh, get the molecules in the fluid moving and create a wind if you have enough sound, actually. And so they have demonstrated uh, acoustic suppression of flames. And let me see if I can actually um, play this. I'm going to see if I can get the website so I can play it for you because they've got this great thing here on in the uh, hangout thing where now we can put now I can put a video in here I think oh add a video to the playlist let's see add the video to the playlist blah 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 why didn't it do it is it because I'm doing live thing? Why didn't it work? Darn it! It worked other time. Ah, there it goes. <coughs> Did you see it? I didn't see anything. You didn't see anything? Darn. Nothing. Let me play it again. That's not working? Did you did you chat room? Did you see anything? <coughs> I am not doing healthfully. She's me that's... laughing great. But it shouldn't do that. It should do Why wouldn't it do that? It's up the top, and I press the button. Nope, just us laughing. Oh, sorry. Hmm. Did you see it? Mm -mm. <laughs> Fail. Wah, <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad. Yeah, awkward. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> selfie <laughs> talk. <laughs> awkward. Yeah, that didn't work at all. Didn't work at all. Oh, yeah. Well, Link anyway, sound room. waves. Sound waves putting out fires. And That's pretty crazy. Yeah, and it's really, it's not an incredibly impressive video either, but it's just a sound that goes, Bwom, and the flames go. That's... And then they come back a little bit. <sighs> a week without inappropriate use of a kick it kissing robot? What? <laughs> I didn't realize when I assembled my stories that they were all pretty <laughs> themed in one direction until I started talking and then I realized there was kind of a, an odd thread going. Maybe. Oh, well. It's fun. It was all fun. You were you were <laughs> making up for it for Justin not being here too. Okay, good. good. <laughs> yeah. What was the 
other, okay, so that was my fun thing. That didn't work. Darn it. And so then I had a bunch of news about the FDA. The FDA approved the first drug for reducing the risk of HIV infection. Mm -hmm. Really awesome. They uh, banned the use of BPA in baby products. And that's kind of interesting because it's not a real ban, really, because nobody's putting BPA in baby products anymore because consumers don't like it, but they right. were politically pressured into doing it so that people would be more likely to buy baby products because they, people want things without BPA. Right. So they, did it, they did it not because of what they saw in the science, but because of political pressure. So that's a really interesting story right there. And then the FDA has been spying on scientists that were uh, unhappy with things that the FDA was doing, and um, they spied on all of their electronic communications and basically broke the law because you're not allowed to, even though the government and other companies can spy on, not spy, but monitor the use of the Internet if it's on a a government computer or whatever else, uh, they can't inhibit a whistleblower, whistleblowers, they can't stop whistleblowers, they can't do anything that would keep people who want to be whistleblowers from being whistleblowers, and so uh, FDA might be in trouble. Mm. Mm -hmm. So three interesting FDA studies. FDA, no, you didn't. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> yes, you did. Why am I getting all pixelated? My internet's. Yeah, I'm going eight bit, eight bit, bit, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this website up. I wonder if this is going to work. This is the other story I was going to talk about, which I just love the picture. <laughs> Happy! It's, um, it's Happy lifting, lifting older people. Yeah, lifting weights slows down mem memory loss, which, first of all, I love that headline because, of course, it implies causation and not correlation. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. so they, they looked at... Um, only women, too, which they didn't talk about anywhere in the article. They just kind of mentioned it and glossed over the fact, oh, yeah, it was only women. But it was women ages 70 to 80 who were experiencing cognitive impairment, and they put them on a two-day-a-week, 60-minute weightlifting program with a trainer. So they were being supervised and everything. Yeah. Uh, so they weren't giving old people heart attacks. Don't forget about that. Good. <laughs> but they saw... Uh, a, an improvement in cognitive abilities, and they, what did they say? They saw noticeable improvements in memory and attention, as well as their ability to resolve conflicts, an unexpected bonus. Hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know what noticeable improvements are, but. Yeah. Yeah, so supposedly. Statistically, statistically significant. Yeah. Kind of, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, aside from having physical benefits to staying active in, in your older age, potentially, it helps with the brain as well, which is good. I need to start working out again. <laughs> My weightlifting currently consists of lifting a child. Well, your weight's always pounds. increasing. He's not 30 pounds. He's like 21 pounds right now. You're just going to end up benching more and more weight as he grows, so. Right. Pick <laughs> me up, go. mommy. Right now, he used to, he used to say pua instead of saying up. He'd say pua, and now he's just decided that down is the word for everything. So if, he's, if he wants up, he goes down, down. If he wants down, he says down. I keep trying to get him to say pua again, but he's not saying pua. So I guess he's doing some kind of transition, and the next thing I'll get is up. Yeah, I'm sure. Up. It's a very smart baby. I just picture you now with Kai on the the end of your arm, like doing bicep curls. <laughs> exactly. It's my baby. I yeah, do right. bicep curls, my baby. That's, that's right. right. Maya, uh, so there's what's the what's the move where you do the where you lift your, your feet, you put your legs over the little bar and then oh, you yeah. 
-hmm. lift your feet and there's like the weight on your ankles that you're strengthening your quads. I don't remember the name of that exercise, but I do that exercise. I put one, cross my legs and put my child on my foot and then I lift him (laughs) (laughs) with my lift him with my feet. I bet he enjoys that. Yes. Hmm. Yes, the what now? Yes, I'm trying. I'm. I think we should make a video of um, weightlifting techniques for mothers. <laughs> That'd be good. Yeah. A bottle in each hand. And lift and diaper. <laughs> the diaper Reverse bag behind leg the back. curls. Thank you, zombie Tom Hanks. I don't know. My brain went bye bye. Oh, let's see. Let's see. Yeah. So, how did people think this went? Once we got it, once we got it going, we missed all the music, right? That was not so great. Mm -hmm. Audio quality. Is it okay through what you're watching? Is it all right? I would like the feedback. Great, says Mooncat. Yay! So, how, is there a delay to the YouTube? It's just like a couple seconds, right? Blair's audio is good. My audio is distorting. Okay, so I overdid it somewhere. Yes, am I quieter now? Is that a little better? Not distorting? I don't know. Just turn down the gain a lot. So what did you say, Blair? What did you want? I don't know what I just said. I completely forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Chatroom, what did I say? I don't know what I said. Yeah. What's wrong with my mic source? I don't know. It's I I am hoarse. I was almost losing my voice during the show. I am recovering from a cold that has been Kicking my arse all the time. That is what I asked. Look, thank you, Charu. I asked if there how long the delay was to YouTube. That's what I asked. Yes. The buffer delay. Yeah. Blair asked about the buffer delay. Yes. Google YouTube audio is tinny, not as crisp as Twit. Um Oh, well, I can't do anything about the keyboard. That's just my keyboard. It's a loud keyboard. I apologize. Um, I barely touch it, and it's tappity-tappy. I can't... um, If you remember, there is a little microphone thing under your image, and you can hit that and mute yourself while you're typing, but then you have to remember to (laughs) unmute yourself, which I always forget. That's my concern. (laughs) (laughs) What? Why why am I supposed to... You guys hear that or no? No, I think you've got the, uh, I think it was doing the uh, laptop mic. I changed it after a couple minutes in because sometimes, yeah, it doesn't switch over, but I fixed it. It's really weird. That's probably why why we hear the typing is probably. Well, yeah, it says it's on my headset. It was, but it's not. I changed it pretty soon in. That's weird. I guess maybe I'll just restart my computer next time before. Jack Pearson. <laughs> restart the computer. I like well, that. Well, it fixes a lot of things. Oh, yeah. It's, it's cold. It feels nice. Cold in the face. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Jack Pearson in the chat room. Yeah, I need to download the audio for this for our actual podcast, which is going to take a lot more editing than I normally have to do. And I have another thing and the other thing and I wonder hmm a lot of things I need to figure out (sighs) I hope Justin is able to come back in the next couple of weeks (laughs) Justin come back I'm concerned about him (laughs) what's his deal he's moving that's why he couldn't come right yeah he's moving to a farmhouse or something something out in the country where internet um, is bad. Still in Davis, or is he moving to his job? Where his job is now? Oh, okay. No, probably still in Davis. Uh, no. Justin, for I've the children. I've talked. With, yes, for the children. I've talked with him about <laughs> moving in the past, and he's he's always says no because. <coughs> excuse me. His children's mothers are in Davis, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
That would make sense. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me as I cough on camera. <sighs> Um, I need a web page with contact info and chat info, etc. That's a great idea, Aaron B. You are correct. I will have to do that. An announcement on our on the twist.org website. I think will probably be the way to go. And then also um, an announcement on the Twist Google Plus page and mm -hmm. as many other places as I can think of putting announcements on our change over here. Um. Oh, Aaron B has missed the show. Yeah, so now we'll hear about how Justin almost hits cows on his drive. Exactly. <laughs> That'll be it exactly. The um, Google Plus just timed out and said, are you still there? <laughs> like, yes, I'm still here. <laughs> how interesting. That's very weird. Mm -hmm. That's very weird. Leo might retweet it. We'll see. It would be nice if Leo retweeted things or show things. I'll just ask him to. Um, let's see. Yeah, I will need to strip the audio from the YouTube file once that is up and finalized. So I need to. We'll need to mm -hmm. download the YouTube file, throw it into Final Cut. Pro and then take the audio using soundtrack. Is that it? I should be able to do it that way, right? Does that work? Keepvid.com has the option just to download the MP3 audio. Hmm, that's a good idea. Keepvid.com. Okay. I need to write that down. <laughs> Otherwise, I forget things. Totally. Keepvid.com. That's what other people are saying also. Great. Uh, Twit Refugee. Yes, I still have the show broadcast on a terrestrial radio station, kdvs.org uh, KDVS is the station, 90.3 FM in Davis. Additionally, there are um, a few college stations that have picked us up across the U.S. and um, in Australia. So we And we're also on a, a couple of um, online radio stations, additionally. But it's all be like, you know, we give to the college stations because college stations don't have a lot of money. It's all good. And normally I cut a little bit of stuff out of uh, the... Basically, the podcast is the extended version and then the radio show is a little bit edited. I cut it down so it fits within an hour uh, time slot. So, how long do I have before I need to send out the audio recording? I um, usually post it to um, a website by Monday night it's because Tuesday morning is the show. So I try and get it done by Monday night. That's usually what I try and do. I need to find a way to be on a way to be on Premier Satellite Radio. Yeah, and they were, the KDVS was using the extended version for a while because the emails that I kept sending saying do not use the podcast somehow were falling on blind eyes and um, nobody was listening to me. And they're like, why are you sending us a show that has sponsor mes messages in it and commercial messages in it? Like, well, I'm not. I have a radio edit for you that's non-commercial and will completely fit within your FCC guidelines. They just need to listen to me, but they don't. Oh, it would be cool to get Neil deGrasse Tyson as a guest. That would be pretty awesome. I have an idea for a, uh, a Google Plus Hangout that I want to do at some point. I don't know exactly how I will make it happen, but... Um, I have this idea for a science trivia show mm. that would be, I think, a lot of fun. And I don't know exactly how to make the audience interaction 
portion of it work the way that I want to, and I'm imagining using different uh, chat rooms and people would somehow have to register or it would just be a website and they could pick which, it's, there would be a website that would tell them how they could choose their chat room, whatever they want to do, but the idea I think would be so much fun is to get like uh, different science celebrities, mm -hmm. so people like Phil Plate, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Pamela Gay, um, just a lot of people who are really big science communicators and their names are pretty well known and then they will be the competitors on this science trivia game. And I'll be like Alex Trebek, I'll ask the question. <laughs> and then all the people, the competitors would compete to answer the questions and try and rack up points in the science trivia game, but additionally they would have chat rooms following them and so they can go to their chat room to find out what the audience thinks, like what their but the people who are like going for them are suggesting the answers to the different questions might be. So be like crowdsourcing the answers. You can like you could try and infiltrate other chat rooms and try and put them off the scent of a correct answer by putting false answers in and you know, I just think it could be I think it could be a lot of fun. I don't know if it would have to be weekly. I would just like to do it once. <laughs> I just think once would be a lot of fun. <laughs> and then if it worked, maybe weekly, but but once. Yeah. Would that's be good. Awesome. Yeah, so Cosmos is supposed to happen this fall, so I don't want to go up against Cosmos. That won't work very well. <laughs> what would kill it? The chat would just Google the answers. Yeah. No no no. But I think that because, uh, sure, the chat could just Google the answers, but I think that because you'd have people trying to put fake answers, because you're going to have your favorite. You're going to be like, I want to be on Neil deGrasse Tyson's team. And so you're going to go to Neil deGrasse Tyson's chat room, and you're going to try and put the right answers in there. But you might also go, fill plate, whatever, and you'll go to his chat room and like try and put all sorts of wrong answers and ah. mess up mess up the answers that he might might get. And so... I think it would just be a really interesting battle between the chat rooms and then the competitors would have to decide, you know, they'd look at the chat rooms and be like, oh man, do I trust this, do I not, do I just know this, or... I just think <laughs> would you watch? I would watch. That sounds awesome. <laughs> it's like a Jeopardy I could actually answer the questions to. Exactly. <laughs> I think it would be super fun. I was watching Jeopardy recently when I was at the gym, and it was the college version of Jeopardy, and I didn't realize it at first. And I was doing so good. I was getting all the answers. Getting it all like, right. I am on fire tonight. And then I noticed that it's a bunch of college kids. And I'm like, oh, I get it. They gave the easier questions to the college kids. I guess. Yeah. It's slightly better. It's not as easy as the teenage Jeopardy. That's a lot easier, but... The college Jeopardy is slightly easier than the adult version. Very slightly. Yeah. I would like to say slightly since I, I was doing well. Not not a lot. You you're you're a you're a bright woman. <laughs> well thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Celebrity Jeopardy is probably the easiest, even easier than the teen Jeopardy. Probably. Because celebrities are dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen Celebrity Jeopardy, though? The questions are quite a bit easier. Yeah. I am Alex Trebek. Alex Trebek's name is... <laughs> Who is Alex Trebek? <laughs> what? <laughs> Deranged loner Jeopardy? That sounds oh, great. No. Either. <laughs> That'd be all TV series questions, right? And video games. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I like it. Uh, Shut in Jeopardy. <laughs> Shut in Jeopardy. Cats. The answer is cats. <laughs> Toxoplasma gondii. Oh, Gildizator, you're right. We could just do Twitter. People just use Twitter and mm -hmm. see. That's a good idea because then you just do at whoever it is. 
Mm, a science drinking game. Yeah, we could always do that. Science! Drink! <laughs> I'll take squid sex for 300 <laughs> That's awesome. If I ever went on Jeopardy, I would hope there would be an invertebrate sex category. I would have it, man. <laughs> I would have it. You totally would. <laughs> I haven't even talked know. about banana slug sex on this show, but that is man. quite the spectacle. I love banana slugs. I just think banana slugs are the best thing ever. Better than sliced bread, just about. Banana slugs, we, I went on a hike recently in, uh, near Mount Tam in uh, the Mere Woods area, and there's this, um, what's it called? It's called uh, the Tourist Stop, or, oh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's basically this, it's a private club, and they own a bunch of land, and it looks like a, a German settlement. Like, it's all German architecture and the way that they build things with wood and very German-like. And they make beer, and they sell it there. And so you can hike in, and you can bring a lunch and drink beer and just oh hang out gosh. there. And it's really cool. I went there, hung out, drinking beer, eating food, banana slug falls out of the bushes <laughs> onto this girl's shoulder, just like fell from above because we're up against this well, this cliff because it's a steep mountain. Just the banana slug just fell out of the, the shrubbery. <laughs> the most hilarious thing I've ever seen. Never, I mean, if you want to see somebody jump, just drop a banana slug on their shoulder. <laughs> they look so crazy if you've never seen one before. I don't know what you would think it was. You'd probably end up thinking it was alien larva. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just making things up now. Banana slugs. I'm trying to find... I have a picture of myself kissing a banana slug. And I, I kissed a banana that. slug in sixth grade at science camp. Um, camp Jones Gulch. I just did it recently. I was, I was wine tasting up in Sonoma County and... Uh, my friend, actually, Brian from Twit, his friend, I was with him, and uh, and we found a banana slug. And it was actually, it was right next to, there was um, a mockingbird that was making red-tailed hawk sounds. And we're mm. looking all around. We're trying to find the red-tailed hawk for probably 20 minutes because we're bird nerds, ha, too. Ha, ha. Where is that red-tailed hawk? Ha, and ha. finally, we look up in the tree, and the mockingbird just looking at us. Ha ha ha! Mockingbird, Animals. I'm mocking you. I can't even do it. My throat won't let me. <laughs> I'm just gonna cough. <sighs> I love banana slugs. I love mockingbirds, even the ones that sound like car alarms at three in the morning. I, <laughs> I know, that one's the worst. I know. I'm so sad Justin's not here. Justin. Inappropriate. And, you know. Everyone blow Twitter up, right rile now. Rile up the chat room. <laughs> I don't know. Everyone tweet Justin right now. Justin! Jackson, fly! Where'd you go? Come back from the country. Uh, don't hit any cows on your way. So, um, I'm really excited. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Possibly going to be going to um, a live viewing at NASA of the Mars Curiosity landing. Wow. I guess it would be like live because we're in the past when it happens. And there's news that because of our the NASA satellite, not possibly being in the right spot, we might actually miss the landing. And no, oh, no. Where specifically are anyway. you going? NASA Ames, maybe. I'm very excited. Mm. Yes. That's so cool. I get to go to NASA. I've never been to. I've never been to Ames. It's just 
not even an hour south of here, and I'm just like super excited. Maybe get to go on a tour, talk to scientists, mm -hmm. NASA, push some buttons. Will they let you go in a zero gravity simulator? <laughs> Please. I know. Please. I would like that very much. Please. I don't know. Yeah. No. Anything? Thank I you. Like, I want to do the things that the astronaut trainees do. Come on. Please. Never Please. mind. That don't launch things from here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm super excited. Yay! That's and like fingers crossed. Exciting. Fingers crossed. August fifth. It'll be best. It'll it'll be the best. A belated birthday present. That'll be good. <laughs> And it'll be awesome to watch all of the NASA scientists and they're during their seven minutes of terror. And then when they're like, well, we still don't really know. And they're figuring oh, everything out. That's so scary. That's millions of dollars. That's just, if they miss it, that's going to be I know. devastating. They can't miss. They can't, it can't mess up. The engineering has to be done so perfectly, they cannot mess up. Yeah, zombie Tom Hanks, right? Billions of dollars. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Hmm. So, oh, I went to the Sacramento Zoo this week, and I was very excited that I saw one of my favorite animals that I've actually never seen in person, and I finally saw it in person this week, and I put a very... Um, difficult to a picture I put a picture on my Twitter that I thought would be difficult because he was he was really well camouflaged and nobody could figure out what he was and then I put up a totally normal picture because nobody knew what it was and so now I am going to show you a picture and I want to see if anyone in the chat room knows what it is and if not I'm sure Kiki you know what it is but I'm going to put up a picture it was specifically um Gord and Ulysses were not sure what it was. Hmm. But it is kind of an unusual bird. Unusual. But I've talked about him before, which is why I thought that maybe somebody would know. It's one of my <sighs> high mouth to head ratio animals. Yes. You know what it is, right? Yeah. Do other people know? Uh, I don't think anyone knows yet. <laughs> They're just amazing. I love them. So I'd only ever seen pictures, and I thought, I assumed, I don't know why, but I assumed they were a lot smaller. I pictured them as maybe a large screech owl-sized bird. Mm -hmm. But I saw them in person, and they're huge. They're like eight inches tall, maybe ten. They're pretty big. That's big. Yeah, I didn't realize that they were that large. I almost said their name. Nobody knows? <sighs> what is it, Kiki? I think I don't know, actually. I thought it was, an, I thought it was a night jar. No, it's not a night but jar. It's not a night jar. It's, uh, they're from Australia. Yeah. It is a bird. Wait. Good job. Five points. <laughs> Gosh. No, I know what this is. Why am I blanking on this? Oh, you're so close, Identity 4. So close. It's not a type of owl, though. Uh -uh. It's a tawny frog mouth. Tawny frog mouth. <laughs> I'm so excited. I get to work with them, hopefully, at the nice. Jerusalem Zoo. They're, um, they're there. And that will be... Cool. When I show up, I'm, get, I'm basically going to say, okay, I would like to work with all the animals, but before I leave, <laughs> it's necessary that I work with the tawny frogmouth and the hippopotamus. <laughs> You're so funny. I love that. <coughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. This picture. Um... Oh my gosh, this picture. You guys have to see this picture. This is... <laughs> <laughs> my 
favorite picture of Tony Frogmouth, if you guys Google image search them, is there's two of them next to each other on a on a branch, and one of them is an albino, and one of them is normal, and one of them has their mouth totally wide open, and the other one's just kind of looking at him. What are you doing? <laughs> These birds are. Um, can I can I make that picture bigger? That picture needs to be bigger. It's too mm. too small. Darn it! This picture is really cute too. Oh, you can see it well. Wait, come back. Screen share. Work. Work with me. <laughs> I love it. Tony frog mouth. They're just so good. That's um. So my Google Plus picture, I know Gordon was trying to find me before, and he tweeted me, he said, I found someone with your name, but it looks like a frog, this is the picture. And it's my favorite kind of amphibian, it's called a, a choco horned frog. And they mm -hmm. have a very high mouth to head ratio size as well. Good to know. One of your interest points is the head to mouth ratio. Yes. It is. Well, I just discovered it recently because I I started falling in love with all these weird looking animals. I was like, what is it about these that I love so much? And just to throw it all off, one of my other favorite animals is an anteater. And so I don't know if it's a high mouth to head size ratio or it's just an extreme ratio because their mouth is very, 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 very small. <laughs> Right. Oh, it's the one oh on page two there. The yeah. second one. This one. I love that. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, and I know you're talking about this one here. What? Yes, that <laughs> one. <laughs> he has his mouth open. Right. How about that <laughs> one? Just like. Come here, front mouth, dad. <laughs> oh, they're so good. Feed me. <laughs> Oh, little baby funny Oh, my God. They don't even look real. They don't. Oh, I love them. I'm sure that they have been the basis for, like, some kind of Jim Henson character. They must, yeah. I've decided that many of the, uh, the puppets, the Muppets and various creatures of the Henson, the Henson family come from come from things like uh, real animals. Like yeah, frogmouth. well, it would make sense. Yeah. All right, <laughs> it's 9.37. Okay. I'm totally going to lose my voice here. They're from Angry Birds, right? Yeah. Exactly. Sam Eagle, yes, the dark crystal. Yes, absolutely. Um, real quick, someone did ask in the chat room, um, I am leaving for Israel on September 1st. That is when I fly, fly away. But hopefully I can just come on Google Plus and still say hello. And it'll be 5.30 in the morning for me, but that's fine. I'm a morning person. <laughs> that's fabulous. I am not. So yeah. more I power to you. Yeah, I would love to stop <laughs> in and have an animal corner from the other side of the planet. Um, great. Yeah, and uh, if you want to check out my fundraising, it's kind of slowed down a little bit, but... Um, it's still on. Yeah, I still have it. I have to find it now because I'm I moved my window. It's right here. I'm gonna put it in the chat room. And if you want a postcard from Israel, go ahead and donate to my trip a little bit, <laughs> and you are guaranteed at least one. And uh, I'll uh, I'll drop you a line. You'll get a nice. Uh, Postcard with perhaps a an ibex or a camel on it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Zoo pictures. Yeah, and actually, I'm hoping I have to figure out all the technology behind it before I leave. But I kind of want to do like a, a video blog type of thing. That would be cool. There. That so would be I'm hoping cool. on that. So yes. yeah. Okay. But I have to figure out how. <laughs> So just for a moment, back to uh, the tawny frog mouth. Yes. Compare to Fizgig. Fizgig. 
fizz gig. Fizz gig from the dark crystal. <gasps> oh. Rah! Oh, my Rah! God. That's Rah! perfect. Except for the teeth. Except for the <laughs> teeth, right. But, you know, but that looks the pretty idea. dead on. Rah! Rah! I love it. That was good. Thank you. Thank you for that link. Web 20? Web 21. There we go. Uh, okay. So you've shared your link for donations? Yes, I have. There. Okay, you've shared uh -huh. your link. I'm going to go. I keep hearing my child's voice. I want to know why he's not sleeping. <laughs> uh <-huh. coughs> Is he sick I think too? I'm dying. Yeah, he's sick too. Oh, poor baby. We're both sick. I muted Glover. myself for a second. I well, he's building up his immune system. Yes, he is. And so, so are you now, I. too. Yeah. Yes. I read a story about the ten sec or the five second rule today on the internet. That was funny. Where basically um, a uh, microbiologist said, "Better than the, the five second rule. Instead, when in doubt, throw it out." <laughs> I like that one. Yeah. I just did that the other day. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think so. Bye bye. Yeah. Ah. <sighs> okay. Thank you, Blair. Thank, Thank you. you. That was super fun. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for um, bringing extra stories tonight and That's picking cool. up the slack where, you know, with Justin off for the evening. It was. I liked the stories that you themed up. Oh, good. I did. <laughs> I'll try to come up with a different theme next time. <laughs> Or don't. Whatever. Okay. Sure. Whatever, why not? Whatever, whatever seems to happen. This week in animal sex. <laughs> right. Just follow the stories. They will. <laughs> the stories tell you what you need to tell. That's other people. right. You know, That's all, right. It's all out I was there. just a, a channel for the science this week. That's all that exactly. happened. Exactly. Yeah. Everyone in the chat room, thank you so much for joining with us today. Um, our chat room, for everyone who, anyone who's still out there watching and not in the chat room, we are at uh, irc.freenode.net, irc.freenode.net, or webchat.freenode.net with the twist hashtag, twist, quantum club, twist hashtag. And we will be back next week, like we said before, hopefully with fewer bugs. Hopefully with music. I don't know how I can do that through Google+. Plus. I am at a loss for a lot of this stuff all of a sudden. So we'll make it work. Yes. 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 Yeah. And um, I'll <coughs> excuse me. Hopefully Blair um, have news whether or not Justin will be with us next week. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. check with you. We'll check in with you early next week, and I can always just bring stuff just in case. Not a big deal. Write up another limerick. <laughs> Should I just do that every week? No, no. Yeah, limericks, <laughs> limericks by Blair. Science <laughs> limericks. I did. I did um, apply to a college with my essay in limerick form once. That's funny. Yes, I How'd also applied. Not well. I also applied <laughs> to. Um, this thing, I don't know if we talked about it. Oh, yeah, we did, because that one really late night, we played my audition tape for this thing called Month in a Museum in Chicago at the yeah, right. Museum of Science and Technology. Um, and my application to that was a limerick. Or no, it wasn't a limerick. It was Dr. Seuss-esque poem. So it was, it was rhyming couplets like Dr. Seuss. I love it. Yeah, so I did not get into that either. But it's if they don't like my it out poetry... There. I don't want to be there. So <laughs> Exactly. They don't appreciate <laughs> what you have to offer. Yeah. Exactly. Take me with my weird poetry or not at all. And on that note, <laughs> I'm going to go disappear and hopefully yeah. survive the next week to be able to make it back here next week. Hooray! <laughs> the cough go away. <laughs> Pound some Sounds NyQuil and go to bed. <laughs> that's what I'm. That's what I'm doing. I'm ready for it. That NyQuil is calling my name right now. 
Kiki. Anyway, I know. Okay, so I just have to hit the end <laughs> broadcast here, and we are done. So, great. Um, everyone, once again, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for joining us tonight and hanging out in the chat room. And, um, you know, it'll get smoother. And really, really love that you are. I'm looking at the chat room right now. I just love that you are here hanging out. Somebody said 45 strong in the in the chat right now. That's fantastic. We have, according to this, I'm seeing 58 viewers through Google+, Plus, so I think it's fantastic. Fantastic. Yay! Success! Success. Off the ground. We are off the ground and we have nowhere to go but up, right? Exactly. Exactly. That's right, because we were a rocket for science, and I'm hanging That's up right. now. All right, good night. Peace out! Good night. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trying to get your last pose there. Good night. <sighs>